Hi, everyone. Before we start today's podcast, I wanted to tell you about QCon London 2024. Our international software development conference takes place in the heart of London this April 8th to the 10th. Uncover senior practitioners' points of view on emerging trends and best practices across topics like AI software architectures, generative AI, platform engineering, and modern software security. Explore what they've learned, techniques they've discovered, and the pitfalls to avoid to validate your ideas and plans. I'll be there hosting a track on connecting systems with speakers talking about APIs, protocols, and observability. Learn more at qconlondon.com. We hope to see you there. Hello, and welcome to another episode of the InfoQ podcast. I'm Thomas Betts, and today I'm joined by Kurt Bittner and Pierre Pure. Kurt and Pierre have co-written several articles for InfoQ, beginning with a seven-part series on continuous architecture. And lately, they've been exploring the concept of a minimum viable architecture. I personally find the situations they describe very relatable, and I found many of their ideas are influencing how I perform my role as a software architect and engineer. So welcome to the podcast. Could you both please tell us a little bit about yourself? Kurt, would you like to go first? So I began my career a scary number of years ago (laughs) because it goes fast. And what I do, I work for scrum.org, but what I do is focus on enterprise agile issues a lot. And that usually has most people say, well, does that have to do with architecture? But my roots are in software, are in software development and then evolved into software architecture. And I, I find that a huge amount of what organizations are seeking when they're looking to be quote agile, and I don't really like the term, we could maybe talk about that a little bit, but what they're looking to achieve really requires software architecture to do it. And so I'll sort of leave it with that, but this is a hugely important topic to me. And so that's what motivates me to work with Pierre and to try to explore these ideas. So I think we can leave the rest of it for the podcast. And Pierre? Hi. So like Kurt, I've been a software architect for longer than I care to remember. I retired from the corporate world about a couple of years ago. I was a chief architect for a very large insurance company at some point. And this has given me time to actually reflect on all the things I did right and wrong during my career in software architecture, of course. And all the things that we do and don't necessarily make a lot of sense. That's what kind of led us to, well, first I co-wrote a book about five years ago for continuous architecture. Well, actually, we introduced in that book the concept of new valuable architecture. So things kind of relate. Then about two years ago, we wrote another book called Continuous Architecture in Practice, may as well try to put it in practice. And after that, Kurt and I decided to explore a little bit more some of the ideas in that book and try to make the concept of continuous architecture or architecture in general a little bit more practical and I would say implementable. So we we really digging into that. We have been lately, as you say, Thomas, we have been digging into the concept of minimum viable architecture, which seems to be very, very promising. So we'll see. All right. So I want to take us back to that first article that you wrote on the continuous architecture series. It was titled Software Architecture. It might not be what you think it is. And with a headline like that, got some people in the comments and discussion, a lot of conversation around the role and responsibilities of software architects. So What do you see as some of the common misconceptions about what software architecture is and what software architects are supposed to do? I think the first question in my mind is, is there a role called software architect? We talk about software architecture, we talk about software architect as a given. And I was myself, my job description for a long time was software architect. But the question is, is there really a role for that? So that's the first, and I'm not saying there is or there is not, but I think the people should really ask themselves, is that really a role? There's a lot of talk about software engineering lately and the role of software engineer. And there's even a school of thought that believe that architecture is part of software engineering. And I've been witnessing a lot of the people I know well at companies like Google, for example, their job title moving from software architect to software engineer. They still do the same thing, by the way, but the term changes. So that's a good question. And then the big one for us is, should an architecture be developed up front? No. As traditionally, the old concept of waterfall, I create my architecture as a big bang. Or should we recognize that we can't really do it up front? And should we really develop it as we go? Which makes the thought makes people cringe, but that's really what's happening in reality. To that, I would add, my experience working with agile approaches has led me to a point where Basically, we wrote an article about this later in the series, but it leads me to basically a skeptic's view is to say that everything that anyone can say about the system 
is an assertion that may or may not be true. And with that, you have a set of requirements. Those may or may not be true. You have a set of assertions about how you're going to meet those requirements. Those may or may not be true or may or may not be achievable. And so everything that you do in building a software system basically needs empiricism to test the ideas. And then we circle back to the original article where we said, you know, the software architecture isn't a set of diagrams. It's not a set of review meetings. It's not a software architecture document, but it is a set of decisions that the team makes about some critical aspects of the system, how it's going to handle memory consumption, how it's going to handle sessions, how it handles throughput, how it handles security. And those decisions get made whether or not you have a software architect role, whether or not you even recognize that you have a software architecture. Our assertion is that it's important to recognize that you do have a software architecture because of the decisions you make, whether or not you realize that or not, and that you're better off being explicit about those decisions and being explicit about your assumptions and then testing those assumptions. In a sense, what we're trying to do is inject empiricism and skepticism into the software architecture discussion. Yeah, there is a very important concept beside the decision. I mean, decisions, one thing we have to realize is there is really no absolute right or wrong way in software architecture. Software architecture is really a series of compromises, what some people call trade-offs. And uh, that makes some people uncomfortable because, you know, if you start basically building a software architecture and you recognize from the start that your software architecture may not be right, maybe just good enough, but just good enough, that makes people kind of cringe a little bit. <laughs> you know, it's very uncomfortable. So the concept of trade-offs, to me, it's really what makes a good, you know, I even hesitate to use the word architect anymore, but a good practitioner, good or bad, to be able to actually make the trade-offs when it matter and try to limit the downsides, if that makes sense. Yeah, I think one of the quotes that I dug up when I was reviewing the old articles was, software architecture is about capturing decisions, not describing structure. And those diagrams, the boxes and arrows, and we think, well, that's the architecture. And you're saying that idea falls short. And I think one of the places that introduced me to the concept of architecture decision records and the purpose of those being to write down those decisions. Can you talk about that a little bit more about why that is maybe a better way of capturing the architecture than having just the boxes and arrows? Absolutely. Decisions are going to stick, unfortunately or fortunately, I don't know which one sometimes, for a long time. And I think it's very important as we make decisions. And uh, there's another question, which is what is an architecture decision versus a design decision? That's kind of an interesting question as well. But as we make decisions, okay, I think it's very important to record them somewhere. It doesn't really matter where, but it's important we keep a record of who made the decision, why, and when you decided for a way to go for basically what we call a solution, to understand also which one did you discard, because you can learn more about what you discarded than what you selected. It's very interesting. Where you keep your ADR, for short, doesn't really matter, but what we think is good practice is to keep it as close as possible to the code. So if you happen to use GitHub, for example, it's a good idea to put your decision in GitHub, because the closer they are to the code, bigger the chances are that it will be maintained. The last thing you want is an ADR that gets stale because then the decisions are just meaningless at this point. The other thing, your question, one of the things that for me is implicit in it is what is an architectural decision? So the simplest definition that we came up with is that it's one that becomes, in a sense, exponentially costly to reverse. And I don't mean exponentially in the exact mathematical sense, but I mean that Design decisions, the decision to use one component versus another, relatively simple. You change a set of calls and it's relatively easy to replace. What's harder to change is the whole concept behind that. And what usually that means is that, you know, your significant data structures that you're passing around, you know, in modern parlance, the the major classes that you use to exchange information between different parts of the program, those decisions become very costly. Your ways of dealing with concurrency, your assumptions about essentially timing of events and things like that, if those turn out to be wrong, you're talking in some cases complete rewrite. And actually there's a situation that's worse than complete rewrite. And that is if anyone has ever remodeled a house, you realize that it's more expensive than building a new house because you have to tear out all the old stuff 
And then you've got to put in all the new stuff. So you've got the cost of dismantling and the cost of rebuilding. And the same thing happens in software. And so those architectural decisions are those things that are extremely expensive to change. And the importance of the architectural decision record or ADR is that you ought to preserve for the future people who will work on this system, your thought process at the time. So they can look at that and they can either agree with your decision or realize that decision doesn't apply anymore. And we're going to have to make a different one. So I think that's the thing is it's like leaving breadcrumbs. Well, breadcrumbs, maybe not in the Hansel and Gretel sense, but, but in the, you know, markers along the way that says, you know, I was here, this is why I made this choice. And then for people in the future, and that may mean, you know, a year from now, it might mean 20 years from now, it might mean 40 years from now, because we do have some systems that are around 40 or 50 years now. And most of it, you look at it, and you have no idea why people made decisions. So anyway, that's sort of, for me, is why the decisions end up being important is because architectural decisions are extremely expensive to reverse. And, you know, it can be a mystery to figure out why you decided to do that unless you leave some rationale. Yeah, I think I described it to somebody as watching the Olympics and imagine if all they showed was the people who got the gold medal. You don't see any other people, whether they got the bronze or silver or ran the race, and you don't get to see the event at all. You just get the results. And sometimes what the diagram captures is this is what has been decided. And going back and saying, well, why was that decided? And if you don't have it, you don't have those breadcrumbs, that explanation of why did we make this decision and why did we choose this over something else? And what were the other things we considered? Having that for the history is important because a year or two from now, when somebody says this isn't working very well, let's just throw it out and start over. Well, why do we not want to do that? Why did we go down this path? And maybe you make a small adjustment based on being able to see those previous decisions. I think that gets us into the idea of you're talking about trade-offs and those trade-offs come down to the quality attribute requirements. One of those guiding principles you talk about for continuous architecture and a lot of the articles you've written are quality attribute requirements, QARs. That's things like performance, scalability, security, resilience. Some people call these the illities, right? So why is that important to think about early on? Why do you need the QARs early, even if you're building an MVP or something that's just going to have a few users or a small workload? So any architecture is really driven by QARs. I mean, there is no, if all you have is a set of functional requirements, then any blob of code will do. Unfortunately, you won't be able to run it, but it will do. The QRs are really, and I think that's being recognized much more than it used to be 10 years ago, but now people are realize that QRs are important. The, the challenge of QRs is it's very really hard to pin them down. And you get into a paradox, which is you need QRs to make decisions to build an architecture, but you don't really know what the QRs are. Take scalability, for example. Okay, When you start a system, you know, try to guess, and I use the word guess on purpose, try to guess how much, <laughs> where well, you scale your system is a guessing game, don't think more. And unfortunately, so nowadays people just solve that by saying, oh, just, you know, I'm just going to do, put that in a cloud somewhere. It becomes a cloud provider's problem, not my problem. I just sign a check. Well, that doesn't work very well, clearly. And part of the problem with scalability, for example, is that you may want to scale up or scale down, depending on how successful your product is or is not. And hence the problem, because it's actually, it's difficult to scale up. It's even harder to scale down. So you may be stuck with, an architecture which basically you don't need anymore. So reversing, I mean, back to the reversing discussion, reversing a decision that was made to make a system scalable to say, I don't know, I decided I should be scalable, I should be able to handle a gazillion transaction a day, okay? And oops, I didn't get a gazillion transaction, what do I do now? So you basically are stuck with the consequences of decision. And also that led us, we're probably not going to talk much about that today, but that led us also to try to understand what is the impact of architectural decision on technical debt. The other thing about QAR is that's interesting, you know, before I introduced this idea of skepticism. And so you have to also question the QARs because basically what well-meaning, you know, the people who are paying for the system, I'll just call them the business people, but they might say, well, we want the system to be infinitely scalable. Well, then, you know, I can almost guarantee it's going to be infinitely expensive. <laughs> and so the problem is, is that the QARs you get might be right or they might not be right. They're basically what the people who are giving you the information believe is true at the time. And they mean well, 
but they might not actually be what you need. And so as you deliver product increments, you know, and we'll talk about the sort of MVP, MBA pair later, but, you know, as you deliver increments of the system, you learn about performance, scalability, security, and all of these other qualities, if you're looking to learn, right? You know, so you have to build tests in to learn about those things, but you learn about these things and then you might discover that the QARs aren't right, that they're over-specified and you need to sort of scale them back. Or you might learn that they're not aggressive enough and they need to be amped up. So there's this constant interplay in the information that you have available, both the QARs and your ability to respond to that. So I guess the important thing for me is that, you know, the initial QARs are a starting point and you learn more about it, just as you learn more about what you build in the performance of a system, which is complex and you can't always predict the interaction between things at the beginning. And you also might find that, you know, you have two different QARs and they're basically in conflict. You can't achieve one and achieve the other. And so that's where you get into trade-offs and not just trade-offs in the design of the system, but also trade-offs in the actual QARs themselves. Right. So you need it to be more performant or less performant, but now we have new security requirements. We cannot budge on those. And so we have to sacrifice a little bit of performance because requirements are there. And I think you mentioned a key thing is you have to test these. And I can't remember if it was in one of your articles or some other thing on InfoQ got me to the idea of basically a scientific method to testing these. You form a hypothesis about your QARs. Like we think we need this performance or we think this is going to be adequate, but until you write it down and test it and then check the results and have that feedback cycle, I think we see that done fairly well in product functionality. Like we're going to put this in front of the customer. We're going to do A-B testing some way to figure out, is this the feature that they need? You're talking about the same sort of for the architecture requirements, testing those, right? Yeah. I encountered this really early in my career. So after being a developer, then I went to work for a large relational database company. And almost the first thing that I did was performance benchmarking of different system configurations. And you learned a lot about, you know, how to tune and how to improve performance. And sometimes what you found is in a sense, the the relational database design was wrong. You needed to denormalize it or you needed to do something. But but that notion of testing it, actually, you know, not just looking at it on paper, but actually, you know, building at least a prototype of it, if not a small portion of the real system and testing it ends up being really important. And then you can extend that idea to virtually everything. And the art of architecture, in a sense, is trying to figure out what's the minimal subset of the real system that you need to build to figure out whether your architectural hypotheses are correct. And I think that is a critical point, because if I recall back to my years <laughs> in at the insurance company, we tended to really test, yeah, we tested, but it really happened late in the different cycle. So one mechanical kind of question oneself to say, wait a minute, at that point, if you find something really drastically wrong, what are you going to do about it? Probably not much, because you committed to a certain delivery date, and you have to make that date. So... I think testing, building as little as possible a system of the architecture, really, and testing it as soon as possible is really cool. It's a very important point. Well, I think that gets us kind of hinged at a little bit, the minimum viable architecture. People are fairly familiar with the term minimum viable product, but I also know that that's one of those terms, MVP, that gets thrown around casually. And maybe let's start with that. Just to get on the same page of what an MVP is, what is an MVP and what is it not in your mind before we start talking about the architecture? Yeah, so Kurt and I were working on, I don't remember when that happened. That happened probably maybe a year ago, a couple of years ago, when we were working on one of the first MVP and VA articles. And we said, wait a minute, most people think MVP is something for startups. Okay, if I'm a startup, I want to roll out a minimum viable product as soon as possible to test my customer base. And the product doesn't need to be clean. It doesn't need to be pretty. It can just be something that I can put in the hands of customer. It could be just a mock-up. But more important, I want to find out whether my customers want to buy or not. Okay. And we started thinking and saying, wait a minute, the definition is kind of limited because if you expand it and you say, now I have a new product, I'm an established company and I want I have a new product I want to roll out to my customers. Would it make sense to start releasing by little parts, if possible at all, little bits of product and try to test the impact? on my customer base. And before it's too late, when I basically find out that my customers aren't buying what I'm trying to sell, I can back out and change direction. 
So the MVP concept became to us more like something that we can actually, we take a big release and we cut it down in smaller parts. And each part, smaller part becomes an MVP. And then, of course, we extend your definition and say, okay, if that applies to MVP, why not really have a similar definition for architecture and MVA? So each MVP has a kind of uh, associated MVA. One of the articles we talk about, two climbers linked by a rope, and they climb basically in concert. Yeah, to expand on a couple ideas in that, in Scrum, which I'm most familiar with, the intent of every sprint is to produce a potentially valuable product increment. Well, essentially every sprint or every product increment is really an MVP when you think about it. Testing a set of assertions about the value of things that you're developing in that increment. So it was sort of a natural extension for us to think about, well, how much architecture do you need to support that MVP? Well, the way that we came around to it is that, you know, the MVP and the MBA are linked, but how much architecture you need is... In a sense, your MVP, if it's successful, it's kind of a contract that you make with your customer saying, here's a bunch of functionality that we're delivering to you. If you like it, we're in a sense committing that we're going to support that for the life of the system or the life of the product. Ah, okay. Well, that gives us some guidance on the MBA is that we need enough architecture to make that statement true to say, yes, we could support that. Doesn't mean everything has to be in place. We could say, yeah, you know, at some point, the number of users is going to grow beyond a certain point. We're going to need to rip out this and bolt in that. But we think that the work associated with doing that is within, in a sense, the acceptable cost of the system. So, okay, you know, we could accept that. Then our MBA doesn't need to be super scalable right now, but as long as we have a path to super scalable, if that's ever needed, we could get there and so on. So that notion that the MVP and the MBA kind of march along almost like these two people linked by a rope, you know, the MVP could get a little farther ahead at some points and the MBA could get a little farther ahead at some points, but they're kind of linked together because you're making these commitments every release that the system is going to be supportable. Anyway, so that's the idea. And then maybe the second thing to mention about the MVP is that I think some people think about it as a throwaway prototype. And we don't. We think about it as it's an initial commitment to basically support the functionality that you're delivering. And so many times I've seen organizations and teams make this mistake is that they think that the MVP is a throwaway, but then the user loves it and they go, well, let's put it in production next week. And the team is just like freaking out because they know the system won't support that. So rather than getting yourself into that problem in the first place, if you make sure that the MBA matches up with, in a sense, the expectations behind the MVP, then you've got a chance, you know, for incremental releases that don't disappoint people. Yeah, I like the idea of that rope analogy of two people that either one can be in the lead, but it can't be so far out. And it goes back to the idea you said not having the waterfall, big bang, architect everything up front. The architecture didn't go off running ahead and blaze the trail and now the product gets to follow it. Because the problem with waterfall was always, if that trail that you blazed wasn't correct and you didn't know until you started developing it, then what do you do? And that's why you want to keep it closer. So yes, you can go forward with some of your architecture decisions, but having that balance of what do we need for the next two weeks, the next three months, whatever you're looking at, that really constrains, you know, don't over-architect it. And associated to that is the realization that you have to realize some of your, or most of your decision may be wrong at some point or may become wrong at some point. So the question you have to ask yourself is what happens if they are wrong and what do I need to do to reverse them? I know it's scary thing. <laughs> There's an analogy when I was in my 30s, I was really sort of gung-ho on whitewater kayaking. And there's kind of a technique you learn pretty quickly and you can describe it as look far, look near. So you need to look far to see where you ultimately need to go. And you can't let your short-term decisions get you trapped into a place that would become undesirable or even very dangerous. And yet that rock that's in front of you immediately, you need to get around that thing. So you've got to look near to make sure that the near-term decisions are correct, but you also have to look far enough ahead to make sure that you're not essentially making decisions that are going to put you in a bad place. And in the product sense, in a bad place means that the product won't be supportable anymore or won't be viable anymore. So I think that, you know, if you think look far, look near, it gives you some idea that you're doing releasing product increments. You can't completely ignore where you think you're headed in 18 months. 
But you also can't just make sets of two-week decisions and never look ahead. But you can't completely look ahead because you're going to end up on a rock and, you know, a down and in a place you don't want to be either. I know it's right off. Pierre, you said sometimes you make the wrong decision and we can always say it's right and wrong, but there's also no right and wrong answers that it's always trade-offs. And it comes back to the idea of if you have some way to test it, you didn't find out that you were wrong. You found out we didn't meet our goals. Our architecture requirements said this and our new product that we did in the last two weeks, the last month, we can't support it. We need to change something. But that gets to the smaller changes, right? That this is the minimum viable architecture and maybe the next sprint you're going to focus on making the architecture catch up to where the product went. Is that right? Mm -hmm. That underlines one thing is that for developers, it's good to become familiar with either load testing tools or to be able to write your own load testing drivers, because ultimately you need a way to simulate those loads that you might get at some point and being able to do that, you know, with some, some kind of randomization so that you don't create systemic biases in your testing itself. It's a good skill to come up with. And it gets into cross-functional skills on the team. You can't basically enlist another testing group to do this for you. You as a developer need to develop the skill to test your own software. And in an architectural sense, that a lot of times means different kinds of load factors on the system. Well, I like that goes back to the idea that we had started talking about at the beginning, that is there a role of an architect? And you said every engineer has to have some responsibility of doing that. And that being able to test it is one aspect of that. Like if you're going to come up and make the decision, you need to be able to validate those decisions and that anyone on the team can theoretically do that work. And again, don't hand it off to the architect to figure out or the load test team to figure out. Like It's part of the product. Absolutely. One thing, Thomas, we actually did mention when we're talking about decisions is the concept of decisions who are being made for you. What I mean by that is when you use a framework, when you use any kind of external uh, open uh, software, some decisions were made when that software was built or the framework was built. And people don't necessarily realize that by using that framework, that software, you actually end up having that thing making decisions for you. And there are consequences to that as well. Kind of almost hidden decisions that come back and haunt you at some point. And security is, of course, an obvious one. And using those frameworks, that's another trade-off. Like maybe it gets us there faster because, you know, a lot of this infrastructure and the low code was already taken care of for us and we didn't have to write that. But maybe that will only meet our needs for the first year and then we have to come back and, and revise it. Yes. And when I hear uh, more and more people relying on AI to help with architecture, therefore helping with decisions, I get a little scared because three of us have used quite a lot of chatbots, right? I use... Gemini quite a lot every day. And sometimes you get plain wrong answers. <laughs> the problem is some answers are easy to check. For example, if you ask some information which is available on the web, you can double check it easily. When you use that to build an architecture, this becomes a little bit of a dangerous situation. Yeah, I think when ChatGPT first came out, I did have it write an ADR for me just to see what it came up with. And it was in the ballpark. It was completely off base. But I also knew enough because I had it write one that I already written. So I knew the answer I'd come up with and I could see like, well, here's where I would ask it more questions. And if you treat the chatbot as the rubber duck, the pair programmer, like, and have the conversation with it, then it's useful. But I think you can't have the chatbot play the role of the architect and then you don't have any responsibility. It's just another tool to help you make these decisions. So everything we've been discussing, I think, has built up to the idea of continuous architecture. And I wanted to kind of wrap up with that. What exactly is continuous architecture? Like, what's the core idea? And what are the benefits that you see that it provides? So if we go back to a few things that we've talked about, architecture is about making decisions. So then continuous architecture means continuously examining, testing, and proving out the decisions that you're making about the system. It's easy sort of to associate it with different kinds of automation, like continuous integration or continuous delivery. And those are important technologies and maybe continually assessing the quality of your decisions. For example, you might build in a set of tests that analyze the load performance of the system and you build that into your continuous integration pipeline. And then in every single build, you get feedback on whether that system is actually doing it. You want to do that testing in the background, by the way. You don't want to have it be synchronous. So I think that you, know, you can utilize these different continuous something technologies 
to assess the quality of your decisions continuously. But it's also a mental frame of mind that you adopt about continually questioning your QARs, continually questioning the the ability of your design to meet those QARs, and then continually gathering feedback to see if your decisions are right and continually making trade-offs. So in a sense, you could net it out to say you're never really done with architecture. You're always continually reassessing whether the architecture is still suitable. And that's why we wanted to pair up that minimum viable architecture with the minimum viable product. So in every single release, you should be asking yourself, are our decisions still valid? How do we know? And what evidence do we have that supports that? And it's not just a set of beliefs. So that's what it means for me is continuously testing your assertions and your beliefs about the system's sustainability. Absolutely. I think that the whole concept is architecture is never done. And therefore, you never done your decisions. Decisions themselves will evolve. You'll have more decisions, fewer decisions. They will change, unfortunately, but that happens. The architecture will evolve. And you don't really have a point of time when you make a decision. You really have this continuous flow of decisions that are being made over a lifetime of the product. And I think the idea of expecting it to change over time changes your mental model. And Kurt, you were saying that if you go in assuming you can make all the decisions up front and you're going to be right and you've just spent enough time in analyzing it, you're bound to be wrong in some of those and rather approach it with the idea that we are going to be checking every so often and it gets you into thinking I can make smaller decisions and how do I validate those decisions and all of that just affects your whole process. And that's saying that the whole team needs to embrace not just the one ivory tower architect, right? Absolutely. Well, I think that's a great place to wrap things up. Kurt and Pierre, thank you both for joining me today. Thank you. Thanks for having us on. And listeners, if the subjects we talked about today are interesting and you want to read more or join the discussion, please go to InfoQ.com. There you can find all the articles written by Kurt and Pierre, and you can leave a comment on any of those articles or a comment on this podcast. So thanks again for listening, and I hope you'll join us again soon for another episode of the InfoQ podcast. Thank you.